at the end of class on, um, well, before Thanksgiving, <coughs> we were talking about icons, and I had my slides all screwed up, so I didn't actually do what I wanted to do talking about icons. But what we had talked about was the fact that the old Roman idea that uh, images drop the presence of the emperor to wherever the statue might be, right? We talked about that with Constantine. That's an old, long-standing Roman idea, uh, that the image bears the presence of the person depicted. This translated into the Christian idea that icons, images that help facilitate your prayer, also function similarly. So when we look at Sandy Pala and Rosetta, we talk about the fact that they're saying that his wife are kind of looking at each other across outer space, as if they are really there, because they never were. And this idea translates into icons, which can also be seen as, and many people thought them as, actually bringing the presence of the person who was illustrated uh, in front of you as you held the icon. Right? That there's, that there's more to it than just an inert piece of paint on a wooden panel. Right? And that these icons, well, back up. The other thing that, that tied into that was the idea that Christians had begun using, going quite a ways back, <coughs> the third century at least, the idea that they would visit the bodies of saints, they would visit graveyards or holy sites, with the idea that the holy site itself made your prayers more special in some way. Right? Parse that much more deeply. These two ideas, the idea that a relic could bring the presence of that saint to you, even though the saint is dead, heaven. Or that an image could bring the presence of a person to you, those things come together to inform the way in which people use icons. And they would believe the icons were to have all derived from paintings that were made from life or from visions uh, by artists who were directly associated with the holy figures. And so images of the Virgin Mary were believed to all come from prototypes that were painted or drawn by St. Luke, one of the four writers of the life of Christ, one of the four gospel writers, who was believed to have been not only a doctor, a physician, but also believed to have been an artist. There's a tradition that I go in quite a ways back about to the time of this icon. Century or so. so this one shows the Virgin Mary with Christ on her lap, surrounded by two intervening saints and two angels up above looking toward heaven, believed to come from an image that Saint Luke himself had drawn. And for this reason, what we see when we look at icons is not a lot of innovation. Most icons follow very particular types. Because they have that pedigree. Because the people believe that they reproduced the vision that St. Luke had to begin with. That meant that if you varied it, right, if you went astray from the original, it would have less value than it would if you copied it directly. Icons got their values from how faithfully they reproduced a type. And that means when we look at icons on the norm, the majority of them fall into very distinct layouts that don't differ much from icon to icon. Now, there are different types, but they fall into particular types, and we can lay them. Okay. So, for example, how do we see the image of Christ as judge of the earth, raising his hand to um, separate those of us who are good from those of us who are bad? It's the book of life in his hand. Uh, this type was known as the Pentocrator type. Now, these are uh, being used in the Byzantine Empire that speaks Greek. Pentocrator simply means a judge of all, judge of everyone. Our virgin and child on the right is a type that we call the Theotokos, the bearer of divinity, where we see the Virgin Mary on a throne with Christ directly on her lap. 
she bears God. And this is a theological concept that was only arrived at in the 6th century, that Christ was fully God when she was bearing him. She brought him to earth and made him human. So the Theotokos type is this one, where he sits on her lap and looks out at us. These are two of the numerous types of icons that we can find in the Byzantine Empire. Here is a later one, so-called Vladimir Virgin, and also the Virgin Mary of Christ, also believed to have been originally painted by St. Luke. This is simply a copy. But you can see that even though it has the Virgin Mary and Christ together, it's not the same composition. It's not the same layout. She no longer has him resting, sitting on her lap. It's not emphasizing that aspect of her character, the bearer of divinity. Instead, she toddles him. She has her hand under his hips. She brings him toward her, and his face presses gently into hers as he reaches up his little hand around the back of her neck. The other hand reaching up to grab onto her towel over her head. This type is called the Eleusta type. And simply what that means is an icon that focuses on the virgin's tenderness, her care for Christ, her motherly care. And even though she looks at you, she presses her cheek into her son. This is her cheek into his as he looks toward her. Now you'll notice with both of these that they again continue to be fairly flat. Not a lot of three-dimensionality. They don't look like sculptures. They don't attempt to give us a lot in the way of cast shadows or a sense of physical presence. That's because the presence that is brought to you is in fact a spiritual presence. And they are meant to be evocations of a great spiritual truth, the, the breaking down of the barrier between this world and the next. And as such, the icons tend to be very abstract, so that they can better emphasize the spiritual element of the art. Now this one looks called the Vladimir Virgin because it actually belonged to the city of Vladimir and had been given to them by the Patriarch of Constantinople, the spiritual leader of Constantinople, and was in fact the lead to work miracles. It's very present, bringing the Virgin there so that she could work miracles around it. Over in the Dumbart Notes collection, we have a different kind of icon, a carved ivory icon. And in this one, it's not the same as either of the other two that we see. You'll notice that Christ and the Virgin don't press their cheeks together. Right? They both reach out toward us. The Virgin still has him under the hip to support him, to raise him up so we can see him. But he's blessing us with his hand. He's giving us the two fingers here, right? Just as the priest is blessing in church. And the Virgin, with her hand, the Virgin Mary, is pointing us to him. The hand is over, looks sort of like, you know, MC, behind door number one, right? So she's pointing over at Christ with her hand. She's pointing the way to them. And that's exactly what that kind of icon is called, a hoded gatria icon. The pointer of the way. She's pointing the way to salvation. She's pointing the way to her son. And again, these all copy types that can be traced back through the centuries. The Hodegatria, the original that all of them copied, was also housed in Constantinople and was one of the most venerated objects in the entire city. It was carried in a parade, the original, right? Not this one. This copies the original. The original was carried in a parade every Tuesday around the city of Constantinople that gave it this great fame that others felt that their copies would also have, right? 
the same sort of power that the original did. Copying made objects more valuable, not less valuable. It's the antithesis of the modern art world, where we champion originality. For icons, the copying was key. Right? That brought the power of the original into the copy. Now, as I mentioned, it's part of art ivory, and it's actually part of what we call a triptych. The wings here are hinged, and they fold over the center, like shutters on windows. And they are carved as well with images of saints, and this tiny object, so a yay, right? could be carried with you, the purse, and used anywhere, portably, as you were traveling, to again help to guide your prayers. Now, this use of icons that we're talking about led to a major dispute over the real character and nature of an icon. How were people using these things? When someone used an icon to pray and believed that the icon actually brought the presence of the Virgin Mary in this case, Christ as a child, brought them to their presence. Were those Christians, were they venerating the person depicted when they used an icon, or were they venerating the object instead? Were they practicing idolatry? And this became a major controversy in the Byzantine world. Right? What were they praying to? The person or the thing? Right? The piece of ivory, the wooden <coughs> tablet with paint, or the person that's depicted. And this led to a major controversy in the year 725 called the Iconoclastic Controversy. It lasted for more than 100 years. And what happened was that in the year 725, the emperor of Constantinople, Leo III, decided that people who were using icons were practicing idolatry. And he ordered icons banned. In fact, he ordered all images banned within the Byzantine Empire, right, within the entire realm. And what happened following this decree, banning all images, is that uh, the faithful, the zealous, decided that if new images are banned, then we could get rid of the old ones, too. And they went from church to church, destroying images. That's exactly what iconoclasm means. The iconoclastic controversy is the destruction of images. So if it was a mosaic, they would whitewash over it. If it was an icon, they'd burn it or break it. They were destroying images everywhere. This led to numerous accounts for the people who put a lot of stock in the icons that sometimes an icon might bleed if it was hurt or cry if it witnessed sin. The ban lasted longer than the other third. It lasted all the way to 843. 120 years. It's an awfully long time. Right? When history's in the rearview mirror, we can look at 120 years and say, that's no big deal. Right? How big was the range of years we had on last okay? Right? Tens of thousands of years. What's 120 years? Well, 120 years is what? The Gilded Age, right? End of the Civil War. Not that less than 150 years, but still. Right? We're in that general ballpark. It's a long time for there to be no images allowed in the Byzantine Empire. It means that artists probably went somewhere else. It also meant that when the iconoclastic ban, the ban of icons was lifted, people needed to reschool themselves in how to make art. Because any of the artists working before iconoclasm weren't around anymore. So it's finally overturned in the year 843 by another business member, Michael the First. And what happened when we look at art from the ninth century now, and we jump 140 years, we have to. There's no other art to look at during that time. 
But when we go to the period following uh, the iconoclastic controversy, what we find is that artists begin to turn back to Roman prototypes for inspiration. <clears throat> and it's probably because they're trying to revive the art. So we have a series of artists working for the hundred years after this that need to find other works of art to inspire them. And we have a small renaissance, a revival of ancient Rome that follows the iconoclastic controversy. This is the best example from that mini renaissance. An artist turning to Roman examples to revive the art. Um, a Psalter is a book of Psalms. Most <coughs> Christian books in the Middle Ages are not the complete Bible. It's rare to have the complete Bible like you're used to seeing today. Instead, you would have one book, some books. Sometimes they just have the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Sometimes just the Book of Souls, which is what this one is. Okay. And as you open this particular Book of Souls, it's called the Paris Psalter because it's housed in Paris at the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. But as you opened up this book, the first thing you saw when you opened it was a portrait of the author. So there's King David, seated in the center, shown in the act of writing the book that we we're about to open. Think about the portrait you see of an author on the back of the paperback. You know, saying that you're inside the, you know, if you've got a hardcover book on the inside, there'll be a little bio there, and a picture of them. Well, this is kind of similar, this idea of the author composing, uh, his works. Right? Now, the poet here is based entirely on Roman works, which is why we call this small R Renaissance. Um, here is a Roman mosaic of Orpheus, who calmed the animals with his lyre, his uh, heart. And you can see that our picture of David playing what we call like an auto head or something, uh, on the right, derives from this kind of image. And in addition to that, it's also quite, excuse me, Roman in style. There's a strong sense of three-dimensionality. The figure looks like a colored sculpture in the Paris Psalm. You can tell how he sits in three-dimensional space. This comes from studying Roman art. And the reason the artists are doing this at this time is, in fact, because art had been banned for so long. They're turning back to ancient Rome for inspiration to revive the arts. And we have a short period of time where we turn away from the uh, the sort of flat, anti-classical style that was known. We call this period the Macedonian Renaissance, after the family name of the Byzantine emperor at the time. Philip of Macedon. And this is simply so you don't confuse it with the capital R Renaissance like Michelangelo. And it serves as a reminder to us that Rome, the legacy of Rome, is never gone from Europe. It's always there, burgling up from time to time. So, this is a portrait of King David, a larger image of him here. Uh, follows the Roman tradition of actually having author portraits here. And we see him composing a psalm, and like Orpheus, the animals are calmed while he does this. Uh, we have the sheep bathing in the stream, a couple of goats immediately next to them in the foreground, another one just by David's feet. You can see this cute little detail, David's tapping his toe, because he's writing the psalms. Right? Which are the souls. And I also love the dog. And it gets to know me at all. Those, uh, dogs are my chili here. But it looks as if he's, not only is he enjoying the film, but he's, I think he's like got the involuntary leg action. You know, you ever scratch a dog with his foot? That's exactly what it looks like. He's just totally soothed, uh, by what he's hearing here. And that is a transplant of this tradition of images of Orpheus into David. Right? They're using that as the basic tool. Like uh, other Roman works of art, the other figures that appear with him are personifications. We've talked about this quite a bit. Going all the way back to the Arapacus and beyond, where we saw 
personifications of ideas taking the human form, which was very common in Roman art. We see it here as well. The woman sitting behind David is the music in his head. She's melody. And she's actually labeled for us. You can see some of the words on them here. Um, there's her name right there, Melody. Melody, right? There's another name here, another name that's kind of worn out here. Each of these are labeled for us to get us these human personifications of ideas. Melody inspiring David. The figure behind the column is Echo. David's music resounding, bouncing back toward him. In the background, the city of Bethlehem, David's city, is labeled as well. You can see the verse just on the corner of that little box there. And the swarthy suntan figure in the lower right corner is another personification. He's the mountain of Bethlehem. The mountains around the city. And he's labeled as such. You'll notice that he's reclining, and as he does, he breaks one of his arms over his head in a pose that we've seen a number of different times for reclining figures, relaxing figures, sleeping figures, if you will. This is, again, David's psalms calming the world. And the mountains of Bethlehem required, just like Ariadne did on this Roman sarcophagus in the corner. Or like the drunken Barberini fawn did. All of them have kicked back for one reason or another. So our artist here, in reviving the arts after iconoclasm, has turned very directly to Roman prototypes and adopted all sorts of things from it. The idea of the author portrait is a Roman idea. The three-dimensionality of the figure style is Roman. And this use of allegorical figures is also Roman. This is the main inspiration for this mini-Renaissance that we're seeing after the iconoclastic structures. Now, this is pretty much the height of the Byzantine Empire. The period that follows the Macedonian Renaissance sees the Byzantine Empire at its strongest. Here's a map. They controlled the territory on either side uh, of Constantinople into Asia Minor and into uh, Serbia, Croatia, here, Bulgaria, and whatnot. This is all part of the new Byzantine Empire, the legacy of old Rome, uh, but still remains centered on Constantinople. Uh, so they had quite a bit of territory. South of Italy, even, um, all the way over to old uh, Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq. And around the year 1000, give or take, they were probably the strongest power in all of Europe at that time. But then the tide began to turn, and their fate began to drop off. In the year 1200, Four, the city of Constantinople was attacked by Western Christians. The Fourth Crusade, on their way to fight against Muslim troops in the Holy Land, in Jerusalem, was diverted. They never made it there. And they wound up in Constantinople instead. They sacked the city, calling the people from Constantinople heretics, brought back numerous artifacts to the West. This led to a slow loss of land, a loss of possession. We had originally seen that the Disney Empire went all the way here. All of a sudden, we're down to nothing. We're curtailing it even further. Disney power is totally on the way. And in the year 1453, they are invaded by the church. who take over what's left of the old business and simply translate it into the Ottoman. Now, online, there's a couple of uh, ten-minute art fictions that talk about uh, some mosaic work from later Constantinople, one that talks about some of the buildings in Constantinople um, that you need to play back in order to deal with the uh, worksheet. Right? So be sure you play those and remember that those are part of what they're doing here. 
Um, we've got five minutes left, and I think rather than start up the Holy Roman Empire there, let's stop a bit early here. And we'll pick up with that uh, on Thursday and plow through it. So, again, there's quite a few new uh, 10-minute art fixes online. There are also going to be some worksheets that I'll stagger the due date on for the rest of the semester uh, coming up, and I'll send you an email when those make it out. Okay?